Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, in addition to working on my two Heathkit restoration projects, I've also been working on the design for my HF transmitter. And in today's episode, I'll be going through the schematics, some LT spice simulations and other calculations. So if you enjoy that material, you should like what I've got to show. So let's get to it. For today's episode, I'll be going through the details of my design, starting from the mic input and stopping at the second mixer. And sharp-eyed viewers will notice that I've made some changes to the block diagram, in particular changing to an NE5532 op amp, adding an amplifier stage ahead of the bandpass filter, and using the third output from the SI5351 to provide a CW carrier signal. In the first episode, I said I was lifting many of the design elements of this transmitter from the Experimental Methods in RF Design book, so let's get into details of what I mean, starting with the first item in this signal chain, a common source JFET amplifier using a 2N4416. Following the schematic and text shown on page 6.57 from the book, the choice of a 4416 isn't really critical for this first stage of amplification. Which makes sense, the 2N4416 is designed for service at VHF and UHF frequencies, not so much for audio. It's an older JFET, but is still available today in a SOT23 package as the MMBF4416A, so I'll use that form factor. I did an LT spice simulation, and it predicts 14 dB of gain with 3 dB roll-offs from 45 Hz to 265 kilohertz. Now I had another motivation for building this simulation. I did play around with a few other JFETs including the NSVJ3557 and the 2SK879, but I didn't see any significant difference in performance. Let's move on to the next stage, op amp amplification. The book design uses a single LM741, but I decided to replace it with a more appropriate NE5532 dual low noise op amp. I'll use the first unit for amplification as a non-inverting amplifier. I'll keep the resistor values unchanged from the EM RFD design, so that means this stage has a voltage gain of around 22, which equals 26 dB. Note the capacitor C7 from R8 to ground. That perplexed me the first time I saw that, because a typical non-inverting op amp would have R8 connected directly to ground. But after further study, I realized that R6 and R7 are setting a 50% of VCC DC input bias that we do not want amplified. C7 prevents that, so all that gets amplified is the AC component. The second unit I'm using is a low-pass filter. It makes sense to knock down any frequency components above normal speech, and that's what this guy does. The specific combination of resistor and capacitor values I've chosen makes this a basic two-pole Butterworth response with unity gain. The cutoff frequency can be manually calculated as 1125 Hz, and the results of the LT spice simulation concur with that math. You can see the difference here between the green plot, that's the gain response before the LPF, and the blue plot, that's the gain after the LPF. I might decide to raise the cutoff frequency during initial trials, and if so, it's easy to do so by just adjusting the RC network. So with the JFET and the op amp working in series, I've got a total gain of around 40 dB. I'll revisit that figure later, but before I move on, let's look at the PC board layout. I'm planning on building several modules and interconnecting them, rather than one large RF board and a smaller audio board like I did for the receiver. So for this stage, I've designed a compact layout that fits nicely on a 27 by 42 millimeter board. It'll be double sided with ground planes front and back, and even though I'm showing two traces on the back, those will actually just be jumper wires. The biggest reason why I'm not going to have an etched circuit pattern on the back side of the board is I'm going to make these boards myself. And I've done double sided boards many times. It's just more complicated. It takes more time to, to line up the top and bottom artwork. And there's more things that can go wrong. And I don't really need that type of detail on the back. So it'll just be solid copper. And like I said, I'll just use those jumper wires to make the interconnects. I also want to comment about the choice in op amps. Um, I did watch Dave's video that he made a few months back on Jelly Bean op amps, and for sure there's plenty of other choices out there. But in the end, I looked at the uh, 5532 and I figured, you know, 100 million audio files can't be wrong. Next up in the chain is the double balance modulator. It gets the audio signal from the prior stage through a 10K pot, which will be the mic gain control. 
I'm using the classic MC1496 Gilbert Cell mixer, which is still readily available, even in SMT format. Now, it does need a fair number of external passive components, including various bias and gain setting resistors, as well as a trimmer pot to adjust the carrier balance. The output is coupled to the IF stage using a 13 to 4 bifilar transformer for impedance matching, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. I took the time to set up some LT spice simulations, mostly because I was curious about how the circuit works, and a spice model for the MC1496 was available from OnSemi, which is pretty surprising considering the age of this IC. However, the model was faulty, as I'll explain later. I also did this simulation because using a bifilar transformer with a parallel 2.2K resistor across the primary really perplexed me. There's a couple other example circuits in EMRFD for Gilbert cell mixers that show this architecture, but there wasn't a solid explanation of why. And all the other application examples for the MC1496 show its differential output pulled up to VCC with load resistors or RF chokes. So I decided to reverse engineer the transformer design by starting from the output and working backwards. I had several starting assumptions, the first being that the secondary was impedance match for a 50 ohm load, which as I'll explain later was a correct assumption. The second assumption is a commonly used rule of thumb for RF broadband transformer design that says the inductive reactance at the lowest frequency should be four times the impedance connected to that winding. There are several sources that cite that anecdote, some of which I'm showing here, but I dug further and found a 2012 treatise written by David Fern that actually shows the mathematics behind that assertion. In his paper, David substantiates that rule, showing the calculations that lead to a conclusion that using a 4 times multiplier results in a transformer that's within 97% of the ideal match. So there you have it. The third assumption is a statement on page 6.57 which says to use a 10 to 3 turns ratio transformer for the illustrated IF frequency of 9 MHz, implying that it would need adjustment for other frequencies. So combining the first two assumptions, that means the inductive reactance of the 3 turns of the secondary winding would need to be 4 times 50 or 200 ohms. Doing the math, I calculate the reactance of the three turns on the FT3743 core to be about 214 ohms at 9 MHz, which is close enough and validates those assumptions. Continuing down this rabbit hole, doing the same calcs for the 10 turns on the primary yield that it would have an inductive reactance of 2375 ohms, which, divided by 4, works out to be impedance matched for just under 600 ohms. Note that I'm treating each winding in the bifilar primary individually. Because my IF frequency is lower, I'll need more turns on the transformer in order to hold the inductive reactance to 200 ohms and 2400 ohms. Doing the math, and because the number of turns have to be integers, that works out to a new turns ratio of 4 on the secondary and 13 on the primary. So I'll use that for my design. With that settled, I built a simulation to confirm what audio signal level would be needed to hit the target output power. I've set the carrier oscillator to 5.5 MHz and a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of 300 mV per the recommendation in the book. Target output power is minus 20 dBm into 50 ohms, so that works out to be a 31.6 mV peak signal. I applied a 1 kHz audio input and adjusted its magnitude until I got close to a 32 mV peak at the output and that works out to needing an audio peak level of around 250 mV. Jumping back for a moment to the audio stage simulation, recall that it predicted 40 dB of gain. So doing the math, that works out to a 2.5 mV peak audio signal will get me to the 250 mV peak double sideband output and 2.5 mV peak output for a mic is a reasonable value. But back to that bifilar transformer. I wanted to see if I could confirm that the EMRFD design was in fact impedance matched for a 50 ohms output load. So I built this AC simulation that drives the secondary of the transformer and, sure enough, when you calculate the impedance by dividing the node voltage by the source current, it matches very closely to 50 ohms. I still don't understand how the primary side is matched to a 600 ohm input impedance. I spent several hours of study online and playing around with the simulation and I just could not figure it out. 
So if any of you guys have any insights, please let me know in the comments because it's nagging me. And one last item on this simulation now that I've beaten this topic to death. The error in the on semi spice file that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, the first time I ran the simulation, I got a flatline output. And I'd already double checked my circuit connections before running it, so that meant it was time to scrutinize the model file that I downloaded, and sure enough, there was a mistake in the header. For whatever reason, the node assignments for pin 7 to pins 14 were backwards. So all I had to do was reverse them, making them match the device pinout, and it worked. I let OnSemi know about this issue, and they did acknowledge my request. And here's what the PC board layout looks like. I was able to easily package everything on the same 27 by 42 millimeter footprint as the audio amplifier, which makes it possible to stack these boards if I so desire. It's also going to be double sided with ground planes front and back, and same as the audio board, these traces on the back side will just be jumper wires. Now for sure the 1496 is not the only game in town when it comes to Gilbert cell mixers. There's definitely the NE602 and the more modern SA612 that are also very popular. And diode ring mixers, dual gate uh, MOSFETs, those are also solid designs and everything has its pluses and minuses. And I'm not trying to make a science project out of this transmitter, so that's why I went with the 1496 because it's well understood, I understand it, and I think it'll work just fine. Moving on, let's look now at the IF amplifier and first bandpass filter. Again, I'm leveraging a design from EMRFD with a few modifications of my own. The first stage is this common base amplifier. The double sideband signal output from the Bifilar transformer is applied to the emitter of Q1 through the 47 ohm resistor R6. Based on small signal theory, the input impedance to this common base amp is approximately equal to R6 in series with the parallel combination of R sub E and R5. I won't show the math, but the parallel combination works out to be about 3 ohms, so adding that up to 47 gives you 50 ohms. Now isn't that a coincidence? That matches my earlier conclusion that the output impedance of the Bifilar transformer was matched to 50 ohms. And just to confirm it, here I've built a simulation that drives the input to the first stage, and what a surprise, the simulation shows the input impedance is 50 ohms over a wide frequency range. Reconfiguring the output graph, I'm now showing the gain of this first IF stage. The results show a voltage gain of 9.6 dB, which will slightly boost the signal by 2 dB from minus 20 dBm to minus 18 dBm. Now the reason the voltage gain dB and power gain dB values don't match is because the input impedance of this amplifier is different from its output impedance, so the power gain has to be calculated differently from the voltage gain. The output impedance of a common base amplifier like this is approximately equal to the collector resistor when it's connected to a load with the same impedance. Here I'm using 330 ohms because that's close to the bandpass filter's impedance. And speaking of the bandpass filter, it'll be the filter that I've shown in the first episode. Since then, I've measured its impedance and found it to be around 300 ohms, so that's where that value comes from. Resistors R4 and R10 are chosen to match that impedance, and trimmer caps C5 and C7 will be used to fine-tune the match. The second stage of IF amplification comes after the filter and consists of Q2 operating as a common emitter amplifier, connected to Q3 operating as an emitter follower. Trimmer RV1 allows fine-tuning the gain. Naturally, I made a simulation of this amplifier stage as well, and with the trimmer set to 90%, the voltage gain comes out to be just over 12 dB, and the power gain comes out to be 20 dB. And once again, the voltage and power gains are different because of different input and output impedances. So if I assume a conservative 3 dB loss in the crystal filter, that means my minus 20 dBm signal from the balance modulator will end up exiting this IF filter chain at around minus 2 dBm. And that's a good match for the plus 7 dBm diode ring mixer that will follow, because a rule of thumb is to have your local oscillator strength about 10 dB greater than your peak RF signal strength. Note that there's a second input into the emitter of Q1. That's where I'll inject a signal from the SI5351 for CW operation. I was thinking of using a standalone crystal oscillator, but on second thought it makes sense just to use the third output from the SI5351. The other two outputs will be the 5.5 MHz carrier for the balance modulator, and the third will be the local oscillator VFO signal. 
One last comment on the circuit. I'm showing a Pi network pad here just in case I need to dial down the signal from the SI5351 to avoid overdriving Q1. I spent a lot of time in this episode going over my calculations and estimations for gain, and certainly that's not the only important engineering parameter when designing a transmitter. Could consider noise factor, could also consider second and third order intercepts, and I would show those calculations if I had those calculations. I'm just not at a point where I can do that kind of math yet. And I'm definitely more old school when it comes to the right balance between engineering analysis and actually building something. And I think what I've got here is solid enough that I should build it and try it out, and if it doesn't work properly, I can always go back and adjust it. Yet another reason why I'm trying to make this design more modular than the receiver so I can experiment and make changes if I want. Now, in the next episode of this series, I certainly could continue this engineering analysis and LT spice simulations on the preamp and the final PA, but I'm thinking more along the lines of I'm just going to build what I showed today and see if it works. It's simple enough that I could just have a receiver at 5.5 megahertz and see what kind of signal I'm getting. So I'm leaning more towards that. Setting all that aside, I hope you did enjoy today's episode. I certainly enjoyed making it and enjoyed going through the calculations and simulations to see if my ideas have a chance of working. So as always, thanks very much for watching and bye for now.